Um, TJ, do you have any general comments before we get started here? I do. I want to, of course, Abir, thank you very much for uh, partnering up with me on this webinar. And, um, you know, I just, Abir and I, we, 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 with every webinar we do, we hope that uh, each and every one of you, if not each and every one of you, at least one of you, um, gets something useful out of this that either helps you further your real estate investment career or protects you in your real estate investment career. And uh, we're just, we appreciate each and every one of you taking the time out of your evening, your very precious time to spend with us. And we're going to do our best to make sure that we make that worth it. So I'm really looking for, forward to what you have to say, Abir, and I'm excited about what I what I have to share myself. No problem. Thank you for doing this with me. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. So right now I'm going to put everybody on lecture mode, and we will open it back up after our presentation for questions. And if you have any questions, um you can go ahead and type it in the screen sharing box, you know, and I can answer those questions. Okay. So my name is Abera Koye, and I'm a CPA and active real estate investor. I am the founder of WealthBuildingCPA.com. I own real estate investments in five states across the eastern coast. Um, my primary strategy is buy and hold. I have um, completed other real estate investment strategies such as wholesaling and rehabbing, but my primary strategy is buy and hold. Um, I've helped over 5,000 people like you prepare taxes both online and offline. And the greatest joy that I have is helping clients, friends, and real estate investors such as yourself, become free of financial stress. Hmm. What is the wealth building CPA and the um, advantage? Being in the industry for so many years, I'm very familiar with money-saving strategies, which I love to implement all of the time, combined with my 18 years of experience as a CPA and tax strategist and 11 years experience as a real estate investor and business owner. With this combination, it is always, always a pleasure for me to empower you to make your financial life so much more profitable. And this means that you can trust us as one of your team members so that you can spend more time and money in your business. So here is the Bencho team, and I will allow um, TJ to go ahead and introduce themselves. TJ, why don't you go ahead and introduce your team? Yes, um, once again, TJ Bencho with Aurora Real Estate Investment Services, and we're a family-owned and operated business. Um, my uh, Our team consists of uh, my father, um, who's my business partner, Tom Bencho, on the top left-hand corner, and his wife, Amy, is our in-house realtor. On the right-hand side, you'll see myself, my wife, and my son. Um, the bottom left is our office manager, Betty Bencha, who's also my grandmother. And the bottom right is uh, another office manager and our bookkeeper, Valerie. And um, she is my aunt. Okay. Now, at Aurora Real Estate Investment Services, like I said, we're a family-owned and operated business. We've been investing in Pittsburgh since 1925, and we own over 70 of our own investment units. We provide hands-off real estate investment opportunities for you. Um, we allow you to continue to live the life that you're living today while investing in real estate. And as you can see on the slide, it has a list of the uh, services we do provide. Basically, we do every single thing from start to finish, uh, turnkey real estate investing, um, and I look forward to telling you more about the property management aspect of that turnkey investing later on, a little bit further on in the uh, in the um, webinar. Thank you, Abir. Thank you, TJ. Um, right now we are going to get started. Um, this is a power-packed webinar, so I suggest you take out your pen and paper because you will be taking a lot of notes. Today we're going to look at the fundamentals of entity structure and what I've seen over the years of working with real estate investors, as you know, a lot of people would go to these boot camps or attend, you know, real estate investor meetings, and then they're just total form an LLC or form in Wyoming or Nevada. And a lot of investors really don't understand what entity structuring really is about. 
So my goal at this meeting, I'm hoping that at the end of this webinar, the end of this meeting, that you'll be able to understand exactly what you need to know in deciding the right entity structure so that even if somebody wakes you up in your sleep, you know exactly what it is that you need to know when it comes to entity structuring. There are three aspects of entity structuring. There's the ease of compliance, meaning, you know, what are the compliance requirements, the annual filings, the fees, the meetings that you're required to have and all that. The next one is asset protection. How does your entity protect you from bottom-up creditors or top-down creditors? And the third aspect that we look at is tax liability reduction. What is your tax exposure based on your real estate or business strategy? And for those of you that are business owners out there, you know, I wanted to also let you know that these fundamentals of entity structure would also work in your business as well. So as we discuss them, I will tell you how it also works in your business, not just in real estate as well. An important tip, entity structuring analysis should be done on a yearly basis because a structure that works in one year may not necessarily work in another year. You can always revise your entity structure to fit your current strategy. I think this is very important because a lot of small business owners and real estate investors spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the best entity structure is, and they're thinking, you know, five years down the road, ten years down the road. But your business is always changing. And so there are some people who start out with wholesale, and then 10, 20 years from now, they're still wholesalers. But I know that there's a lot of people on this line who want to start out with wholesale and, and maybe move to rehab and, and then switch to commercial real estate. And if that's the case, um, the entity structure that you start out with is not necessarily going to address commercial real estate right now. You want it to address the real estate strategy that you have right now. And then every year, you would revise that strategy to fit the current, you would revise your structure to fit the current strategy that you have. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the ease of compliance, where to incorporate. I get these questions. This webinar is really based on questions that I get asked by a lot of real estate investors and small business owners. So this is really a practical webinar. Um, I get one of those questions, where do I incorporate? Do I do Wyoming? Do I do Delaware? You know, do I do Nevada? Usually I advise people that you want to register your entity in the state that you're doing business. And a lot of people say, you know, we want to register in Nevada because Nevada gives you, you know, more asset protection than in other states. But if you ever were to get sued, it's the local laws that would govern. And let's say you're in New York you know, and you're in Maryland or you're in California or you're in Pennsylvania and you incorporate in Nevada, if you're going to be doing business in any of these local states, you would still need to register that LLC in that state and have a good standing certificate in that state and register your entity as a foreign entity in that state. So whatever it is that you were trying to avoid in, in the first place by registering in Nevada, it's kind of defeated because you still need to register that business in the state where you're going to be operating. So usually my advice is to incorporate in the state where you're doing business. Um, the next question is what's the name of the company? It really is not a big deal. What I've told clients is it doesn't matter what the name of the entity that you choose. My, my advice is choose a name that shows what kind of benefit a client is getting. If you're, you know, if you're being a wholesaler, you want to choose a name that shows a rehab or an end buyer that, you know, you get properties pretty cheaply and you can give it to them at a discounted price. So even if you wanted to use your name like Ibera Okoye Incorporated, you can turn around and register a trade name based on your wholesale and like quick wholesale for profits. Um, so I can do a Barrow Koye Incorporated. That becomes my legal name. And then I can turn around and register a trade name. And that trade name can be Wholesale for Profits b Doing Business As. So a lot of people, you know, think that if they, you know, use a name as their legal name, that that's the name that they have to use in doing business. No, you can have a separate trade name, which is also called a DBA doing business as, and it can be a completely separate name from the legal name that you have in your legal documents. 
um, what's the address of the company. I um, usually advise people don't use your home address, especially in this day and age of technology, when you're able to um, log into Google and you're able to see addresses. People can pretty much see that this is your home address. So usually advise people that you want to use a completely different um, office address. The name and address of the resident agent, again, you do not want to be your own resident agent. The whole goal of setting up an entity is for asset protection. And if you use a Barrow Koya as a resident agent, and that's the name of the entity, if you're dealing with someone, they know that your name is a Barrow Koya, and they know that this entity that you're using you know, is a separate entity. But if I make myself the resident agent and say I'm the resident agent, anybody can go online. It's a public record and look at the articles of organization. And if they see that I'm the resident agent and I'm the one representing the company, they can put two and two together and figure out that you're the one that owns this company. So usually I advise that you use somebody else as your resident agent. Um, for corporations, you need to worry about the number of shares. Um, that you are authorized to issue. And for LLCs, you have to decide on the management type, whether you're going to be member managed, meaning that it's an, it's an LLC that's managed by the members of the LLC, or whether you're manager managed, meaning that you hire somebody else as a manager to manage the LLC for you. Um, ease of compliance. Um, one of the things that we look at, I'm just going to go quickly through the seven steps that we use with clients. Once we receive the business registration forms, we go ahead and get the articles of organization ready and we submit it to the State Department of Assessment and Taxation. And once we get an acknowledgement, we get an acceptance of filing from the state, we go ahead and get an EIN number from the IRS. After we get the EIN number from the IRS and with the acceptance of filing, we open up a business account. After opening up the business account, we would draft and operate an agreement. An operating agreement is the nucleus of every business. Our operating agreement is about 121 pages. And it's 121 pages because we want to make sure that we have all the legal language in there and all the tax treaties in there to protect you. And then we also look at something called a cash sweep in step five. This is very important, especially for new business owners where you start to incur income and expenses prior to establishing your bank account. So usually once the business is formed, then what we do is to move all of the income and expenses onto the books of the business. That way, when you're presenting your financials at the end of the year, you're only presenting a bank statement and not having to present a bank statement separately and another statement of income for your expenses that you incurred prior to opening up the business or having the bank account. And after that step, then we look at the bookkeeping process, and then you do a review, a yearly review on your annual filings. So really, these are the things that you need to look at when you're um, – looking at compliance for um, your entity. The next aspect of um, entity structuring that we look at is asset protection. It's very, very important that you understand that your entity must shield you so that your personal assets are not exposed. It's not necessarily the size of the entity, but rather the existence of complete and proper documents which protects you. So some people say, you know, I just started. Do I really need to form an entity? My answer is absolutely. If you're going to be out there doing wholesale and rehabbing and there's a possibility of making any type of profit, you want to get protected because anybody can sue you along the way. And two major things that you need to know with asset protection is you don't just want to deal with one type of creditor. You want an entity structure that has the bottom-up creditors, which is, Creditors that have a claim or judgment against the LLC act as a result of things that have been done by the LLC rather than the member. So it's to sue a Barra Okoye LLC, not necessarily suing a Barra Okoye herself. So that's the bottom-up creditor. But you also want to protect yourself from the top-down creditor. A top-down creditor is when a creditor comes against the member, so they come against a Barra Okoye and not necessarily the acts and omissions of the LLC itself. 
So you want to make sure that your asset protection, when you're thinking about entity structuring, deals with the bottom-up creditor and also deals with the top-down creditor. Um, we're going to spend you know, the next 10 minutes really talking about the tax side of entity structuring. This is the most important aspect for me because I tell people all the time, as much as it's possible for you to get sued, it is even much more possible for you to lose money in tax liability because you don't have a properly structured entity. So we're going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about the tax side of entity structuring. There are about 13 real estate investment strategies. Um, you have the real estate cash short-term strategies, which is bird dogging, you know, finding a property on behalf of another investor, quick flipping houses, which is also known as wholesaling, lease options, and sandwich lease options. And then you have the real estate equity strategies, meaning that you're purchasing the property for the equity that you would get in the property, which is through foreclosures, bank, for, bank foreclosures, REOs, short sales, and taking subject to deals, taking sub, the title subject to the existing mortgage. Then we have advanced long-term strategies, which is commercial real estate or rehabbing, rehabbing where it's, you know, a year or more, and landlording. And then we have other real estate strategies such as discounted mortgages, tax liens, and land investing. The reason why I went through the 13 real estate investment strategies out there is because I always advise that you want to make sure that your structure fits the strategy that you have. So you need to know what tax exposure you have with your real estate um, strategy and then find a structure that would protect you with that. So a short-term cash strategy is usually concerned with self-employment taxes and hobby losses. Therefore, you need to choose an entity structure that would reduce self-employment tax. So let me explain it. You know, we just talked about a short-term strategy, you know, like bird dogging or wholesaling. That's when you, you know, you flip a property for a quick cash or you help another investor to find a property and they pay you some kind of um, fee for that service, you know, for this example, let's say $5,000. You know, the other option is where you do sandwich lease option. You find a property, um, get it under contract, sign a lease agreement, and turn around and lease it to somebody else. So the difference that you get in between is, is the quick cash that you're getting. So the reason why you're exposed to self-employment tax is because that is active income. Any money that you make from an active real estate investing strategy is subject to self-employment tax. So as a wholesaler, you're subject to self-employment tax. As a, as a bird dogger, as a, some, somebody that does lease optioning, you're subject to self-employment tax. So you want to make sure that you pick an entity structure that would reduce your self-employment tax. I talk about hobby losses because usually when you have a short-term strategy or, <coughs> or even other strategies, excuse me, <coughs> it's possible that you can have expenses to get started in the business, and then maybe it takes you about a year or two to start seeing income coming in. Well, if you're not careful, the IRS can say that those expenses that you incurred in your first or your second year are really hobby losses, meaning that this is a hobby. You're not really engaged in this for profit, and as a result, they disallow that deduction. So you want to choose an entity structure that would ensure that your expenses are not treated as hobby losses and therefore not deductible. A long-term equity strategy, you're worried about passive loss rules, you know, where you're a landlord or you're planning to rehab and hold for profit. Passive loss rules generally says that if you have an entity, a property that you're holding on to long term and you are not a real estate professional, real estate professional meaning that you spend 750 hours in real estate and more time in real estate than in any other active business. Remember, it's the two. It's not one or the other. It's 750 hours and more time in real estate than in any other active business. If you don't meet those two criteria, you are not considered a real estate professional. 
you're considered a real estate investor. And if you're a real estate investor, passive loss rules would apply. So the IRS says if you make over 150000 you will not be allowed to deduct those passive losses you know, from your rental real estate or property that you're holding long term. So you want a strategy that can help you with passive loss rules. The advanced strategies or other strategies, you're worried about a combination of self-employment taxes like a rehabber as well as passive losses. With a rehabber, there are several things that you do with a rehabber. You can rehab a property and flip it immediately for profit. In that case, you're worried about self-employment taxes. But if you rehab that property and hold it, then you're worried about passive loss rules. So these are the different aspects of taxes that you need to take into account um, in your entity structure, and you need to plan accordingly. So generally speaking, you know, my advice to real estate investors is that you want to start with a multi-member LLC. The reason why I say multi-member LLC is that it helps you with the legal benefits of corporate veil Pearson as well as the tax benefits of not having to file the most audited form Schedule C, which is where the IRS usually looks out for, for the hobby loss. A multi-member LLC would give you legal protection, but also give you tax benefits. And a lot of people say, hey, you know, I don't have any other partner. You know, how am I going to get another member to be a member? Really, you can have a 99.9% ownership interest in your LLC and just get somebody else to own 0.1%. That is a partnership. And, and a multi-member LLC also a partnership does not have to be 50-50. It does not have to be 80-20 or 90-20. It can be 99.5 and 0.5%. If you decide to hold on to the property, you want to stay with an LLC. If you wholesale, flip, rehab, then you definitely want to consider an LLC with an S-Corp election. The reason why you want to consider an S-Corp election is that with an S-Corp um, tax election, you are able to pay yourself a salary. The salary is subject to self-employment tax, but the rest of the income will not be subject to self-employment tax. So there's three kinds of taxes that you worry about, the self-employment tax, the um, federal taxes, and the state taxes. With an S-Corp election, let's say you made $10,000 as a wholesaler, you can pay yourself a reasonable salary of about $5,000. The $5,000 you pay self-employment taxes on at 15.3%, this year it is 13.3%. But the other $5,000, you will not pay that 15.3% on it. You just pay your regular federal and state taxes. So right there, you're saving yourself about $750 um, on a $10,000 wholesale. So you want to make sure that when you're, choose, you know, when you're doing entity structuring, that you go with an entity structure that fits the real estate strategy that you have. Um, before I go ahead and hand over to TJ, I want to talk about our wealth building plan. We provide an integrated approach to wealth building. Um, over the years, um, I've been a CPA for 18 years and a real estate investor for 11 years. What I've seen that is the most difficult thing for real estate investors and small business owners is there's not an integrated approach to wealth building. You know, you go to a CPA who prepares your taxes, and then you have to go to a lawyer to deal with the entity structure. And then you have to go to a business coach to help you with, you know, running your business. And then you need to go to another coach to teach you about real estate investing. But what we offer at the Wealth Building CPA is an integrated approach to wealth building where everything is done in-house. And if we need to outsource, let's say, to a lawyer or to a coach or to a bookkeeper, we go ahead and outsource those. So as a real estate investor that is on this line to a night or a small business owner, you definitely want to think about having an integrated approach to wealth building. You know, you start with doing a financial needs analysis, and then you look at tax planning and preparation. It's not just about preparing your taxes, but looking out for missed deductions, making sure that you're not raising an IRS audit flag, looking at three years of tax returns and not just one year and properly plan for your income and your deductions. And also looking at year-end tax planning, not just showing up April 15th to get your taxes done. Like I tell everybody, April 15th is the tax filing deadline. It's not the tax savings deadline. 
And then we also look at entity structuring. With entity structuring, exactly what I just explained, we take a look at your real estate or business strategy and come up with an, a structure that fits. And that's one of the unique things that we bring to the table because we're not just telling you, oh, just form an LLC and that's it. No, we, we help you to come up with the right entity structure that gives you legal protection, tax um, reduction, and also having the ease of compliance. And once you decide on the entity structure, we can help you to do the business registration and also set up the books. We also offer business analysis meetings. This is very critical. But the business analysis meetings, usually small business owners and real estate investors are wearing all the hats. You know, you're the CEO, the CFO, the money person, the marketing person, and sometimes it's difficult to take an objective look at your business. And so the business analysis meetings is where we act as your alternative board for the day and to help you strategize on where your business is going because the goal of every business is to make money. We also assist you in investment property purchasing. If you want to purchase properties, you know, in Pittsburgh, you know, where we usually invest. I, I have properties in Pittsburgh. We assist you with that analysis. Or if you want to purchase somewhere else, we are available to help you do that analysis. We also do retirement planning and year-end tax planning. So for more information, you can go to the wealthbuildingcpa.com and look at the ultimate wealth building plan after this presentation. So right now, I will go ahead and hand it over to TJ. I encourage you to stay till the end because at the end, we will open it up for questions, and usually we stay on until we get all the questions answered. So TJ, I will go ahead and hand this over to you. Thank you very much, Amir. Well, guys, I want to tell you right now that um, you just heard a lot, a lot of valuable information, and uh Almost too much information to comprehend. Um, actually, for me, the way I choose to handle it is I choose to um, use the services of, of, of a bear and of, of peop other people in the industry um, who have all this information, and, and that is their special. And I take advantage of specialized people such as a bear. Uh, rather than trying to save a few dollars and remember all of that information, and, and honestly, there's so much a bear that you, you have to admit that there's no way that you could give all the information needed in a short webinar like this. Isn't that correct? That's that's absolutely true, and everybody's situation is different. It's not a, a one-size-fits-all. And one thing I always um, tell clients and tell people that I meet is that when it comes to taxes, entity structure, retirement planning, it's usually a fact and circumstances case. You know, you can't just listen to a guru out there who's standing in front of the room preaching to about a thousand people tell you, oh, form an entity in Wyoming. Well, that may work for one person. It may not necessarily work for you. So it's a fact and circumstances case, and everybody's situation is different. So you definitely need an individualized approach to your real estate investing. And I agree 100%. And, um, you know, there's a few things that I just want to recap that Abir touched on that, you know, I, that really stood out to me. Um, as far as the name of the corporation, uh, that's so key for marketing. Um, you know, I, I, my company name, um, when, I, when I'm out selling and, and promoting Pittsburgh and, and my company is Aurora Real Estate Investment Services. It explains exactly what I do, real estate investment services. Um, if you work with me, you get the benefit of working um, with my contracting company. The name of my contracting company is Bencho Aurora Contracting Services, LLC. And what we're going to talk about tonight is my property management company, which is Bencho Aurora Property Management, LLC. Um, so they're all pretty clear as to what I do. It doesn't give people... Um, you know, many, many things to question as far as what I do. Um, as far as what a bear spoke about, uh, the the step-by-step -step overview, I love that. That's what a bear brings to the table, that organization. She can really help organize your company. Uh, the operating agreement, absolutely amazing, protecting yourself. Um, she talked about the 13 different ways of um, building, you know, of investing in real estate. Number one, the, the number one approach that I promote um, that because it's worked in my life and, and builds the most wealth is the buy and hold strategy, long-term buy and hold. It allows you to pass down your wealth from generation to generation and allows for retirement. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about the tenant screening process that we use. Very, very detailed, um, low turnover ratio. 
Um, I've screened thousands and thousands of tenants over the years. And, um, you know, by working with Aurora Real Estate Investment Services, you actually have me screening each one of your tenants. I'm going to go through this at a fairly quick pace because it's a lot of information to gain. Once again, it's too much information to, to be able to uh, portray in a short webinar like this. But if you're interested in learning more, you can email me or call me. Um, uh, later, well, I'd prefer not tonight, but tomorrow, and we can talk a lot more about it. Um, once again, my family and I own over 70 of our own investment units. Uh, I'm a licensed property manager. I've screened thousands of tenants over the years, and I have a low tenant turnover ratio. Um, I don't have control of the screen, but uh, Bear, can you move on to the next slide, please? Okay. Okay, sort of like a bear, I have a step-by-step -step process when it comes to screening tenants. Um, you know, you just follow, I just follow along with the rental application. I make sure I have a complete rental application. I confirm all the facts, um, go over all the details before calling the tenant. I want to paint a whole picture of this individual before I call and speak to them. Um, the only time I call before I have the whole picture painted is if there's any information missing that I need to gain. At that point, I will call them to get that information, uh, but I don't go into any details at that point. Um, and as I'm going through the application, I make a list of questions I have, and I make sure that when I do call that individual, I ask them every single question on that list. That's very important. Moving on to the next slide. The first step after having the application is to run a tri-merge credit report. The tri-merge credit report shows a lot of detail. There's a lot that you can learn from the TriMerge credit report. I could spend a whole webinar talking about how to look at the TriMerge credit report. Um, one major point that I do want to point out is that I do not um, focus on the credit score as much as the content in the credit report. The credit score doesn't necessarily tell you as much as the collections that show up on the credit report, the late payments, who the collections are to, who the past due payments are to. If they're medical past due payments, that doesn't mean as much to me as if they're um, electrical company past due payments. When, there's, when I see electrical past due payments, I mean um, utility company past due payments or collections, that really scares me because that's a tenant that normally bails out on their rent. Now, the positives that I can get from a credit report is when I see – car payments paid on time, uh, student loans paid on time. When I see those things paid on time and without collection, that means a lot to me. Next um, slide, let me, please. Um, let me Go comment ahead. about that real quick. Um, another thing that I do is I never turn down a tenant because they have bad credit. Mm -hmm. So usually um, we tell them up front, we will not turn you down because of your credit. The only reason I'm running your credit report is to determine what kind of risk we are willing to take with you. So if I have people that have absolutely horrible credit, what I'll do is I'll tell them that we need two months or three months of security deposit. You know, I've had some clients who have been willing to pay one year up front, or I tell them if you don't want us to look at your credit report, we're either going to increase the rent or you need two or three months of security deposit down. So I usually do not turn down, um, you know, tenants. I just increase their security deposit. Everybody has their own, you know, method. But, you know, there's what there's a lot of people on the call tonight, and we want you to see perspectives. I own about 11 properties of my own, and that has worked for me. And, you know, TJ is also explaining his own side. So we want you to see, and then you're able to come up with what's going to work for you and your business as a landlord. Part the, I agree, Abir. What The credit report is used is to paint part of the picture. It's the contents of that credit report that's very important. I would, I agree that I would never turn anybody down just for what their credit report says um, or what or their score is. It's a combination of the credit report combined with other things that allows me to make my determination um, whether those those other things offset. Um, the negativity or the positivity in the credit report or whether they go along with it determines what the full scope of the picture looks like. So thank you very much, Abair. And so that step two for me is to run the background report, credit check, cr I mean criminal check as some people call it. And this is very important. This is another part of the picture. Um, this can be negative or positive. I make sure to get to ask the potential tenant 
about every single item that comes up on that criminal or background check. This, this being the screening tenants is not for the faint of heart. If you're scared to ask questions and the hard questions, then you should employ somebody else to screen your tenants because you have to ask those questions to really know what kind of person's going to go into your property. I have tenants who, who've had drug possessions on their background. They've had drug possessions five years ago. I've spoken to them about it. I've had them write me a letter to explain it and what's changed since, and they've turned out to be my best tenants. Um, I've also turned down tenants because if I see frequent law breaks, um, that really tells me that there's a disregard for authority, and I tend to shy away from those tenants, uh, especially – once again, if it goes in conjunction with a credit report that has a lot of negativity on it, and then you throw a background check in it that has a lot of negativity, it sort of all starts to form a picture. Um, you know, if you have a good credit report and a good background history, then it starts to form a different kind of picture. Um, can we move on to step three, please, Abir? Yeah, while we're moving on to that, I wanted to bring this back to the whole thing about entity structuring. This is why it's very important that you need to have an entity structure as a real estate investor. Because here is what I do. No tenant knows that I own the property. All my tenants think that I'm the property manager. And there's this um, owner, property owner somewhere that I have to report to. So when I'm asking them all these questions, and sometimes it looks like they're getting agitated or they're going to feel, I say, you know what, I wish I didn't have to ask you these questions but my boss is not going to take your application if I don't get the answers to this question. So I separate myself as the property owner from being the property manager. And so when you have a registered entity, you have an LLC, like TJ said, Aurora Property Management, Okoye Property Management, or Good, you know, Good, Good Rental Property Management Company, it's a, a the you separate yourself individually from the tenant screening process so that when you go in there to talk to the tenant, you are not representing yourself as the owner. And I never let the clients, I never let the tenants know that I own the property. I always represent myself as a property manager. And I always tell them, let me check with the owner and get back to you. And guess what? I put down the phone and go talk to myself and come back and give them an answer. Very good, so, very good point, Amber. Very good point. I do the same thing because I am the property manager most of the time. <laughs> um, step three, verify information for current address. Uh, this is this is very important. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, not a lot of people, but some people will put a, an address on there that they don't live at or they'll put an address on there they live at, but they do not want you to speak to their actual landlord, so they'll give, the, give you their friend's phone number or something of the sort. So what we use here in Pittsburgh is we go on the county website, which most cities have, and we look up to make sure the owner matches the, the landlord that they put on paper. If that doesn't match, then we have to dig deeper. We have to find out if it's a property manager. We have to find out if this person is really even associated with the home. You're, you have to do all your checks and balances. You call the current landlord to verify the different things put on that slide. Um, really ask the landlord a lot of questions. One of the most important things that you ask the current landlord is, do they pay their rent on time? Do they give you trouble? Is their place clean? Have you had the cops called you know, to that property for this person? Um, this is a big step that I'm going to say right now that 99.9% .9 of people don't do out there, and it would prevent probably – 99% of evictions go to the current property where they live, show up at their door, knock on their door, tell them, you, you know, you lost, they don't have a piece of paper. They didn't submit something they were su supposed to submit and see what their current property looks like. If they won't let you in the property, that's a big red flag. If they let you in the property and it's clean, that's great. If they let you in the property and it's filthy. That's a big red flag. You show up unannounced. I do it all the time. It's not illegal. They don't have to let you in, but it can really cut off a lot of evictions and a lot of problems. Step four, please, Obear. Verify information for employment. I have uh, in capital letters with three exclamation points, pay stubs. I personally will not 
rent to an individual that cannot provide proof of income, whether it's pay stubs, SSI, um, welfare, Section 8, anything. Um, whatever they put down as income on their rental application, I have to have paper proof of. Um, I worked in the more, I owned a mortgage company for a long time. Um, you know, there were stated loans out there. Um, there was a lot of different things. Um, I underwrite a tenant like I underwrote a loan. Okay. And I need to know that this person makes what they're saying they're making so I can actually verify, um, their income to make sure they can afford the property. Once again, my recommendation is not to rent to an individual that cannot provide proof of income. Um, that's just my personal recommendation. I will not do it. A lot of people who are operating with all cash, um, not a lot, but um, a majority turn out to be dealing in drugs. And I want the lowest probability of drugs in my property. Now, to go from there, there's a lot of there's different ways to break down and to figure out what their debt to income ratio is or if they can actually afford the property that's a whole entire webinar uh, to really go over these numbers so i cannot go over them one by one and break them down for you but if you would be interested in learning more about that you once again you could contact me send me an email give me a phone call and i can help you to to understand how to break down those numbers um, so we're, we got the next slide is step four again. Um, let's go to step five. Please, Obear. Okay. Run the numbers, review the facts, and review the list of questions. Um, I look for a debt-to-income ratio of less than 40%. Um, once again, I'm not able to explain in this short webinar exactly how to do that, but I can do that more on a one-on-one -on -one level. Um, also, I will go up to 50% at the income ratio if there's other qualifying factors. Like, a, like I said before and like a bear said, it's, it's part of the picture, but this is a big part of the picture. The individual has to be able to afford your property. So this is a huge part of the picture. If they have higher than a 50% at the income ratio, that means they are scrounging paycheck to paycheck, and they're going to have a very, very hard time paying their, their rent on a monthly basis, even if they look great in every other aspect. If their debt-to-income ratio is 60% or 70%, um, it's just going to be a struggle. Um, so it's going to be a struggle for them and for you. You know, I, I look at it as I want to improve people's lives, not put a burden on them for my own profit. So I also look at it from their perspective. Um, I'm not just looking for people who can afford to pay the, pay the rent. I'm looking for people who can change the neighborhood, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Also, continue to make your detailed list. Look over your list. Make sure you have all the questions that you want to ask. This will keep you on course. Potential tenants want to take the conversation where they want it to go. They want to sell you on renting to them. It's up to you to get all your questions answered and to make sure that they're the right people for your property. Let's move to step six, please. Now, here's the fun part. Here's, here's what I love. All the other stuff is all running numbers, analytical. This is where personality comes into play, and this is where experience comes into play. Um, you really have to know the questions to ask, the right way to ask them, and, and to be very thorough. This is step six, where you call the potential tenant or tenants. I leave myself at least, I say an hour, but really 30 to 30 to 60 minutes to speak to them. I don't want to rush the conversation. I extend the conversation because I really want to talk to and get to know this person. If this individual is not willing to spend the time to speak to me and get to know me and for me to get to know them, then they're probably not the type of person that's going to be able to change a neighborhood. And that's what we like to do at Aurora Real Estate Investment Services. We're not in the business of buying a home. And renting it, we're in the business of changing entire neighborhoods. So the way I do that is I really talk to this person. I really go over every single question. I even, add, I even throw some curveballs at the individual just to see how they respond. If they get upset with me over the phone, then chances are they're going to be more apt to get upset with a neighbor or if it's a, a multi-unit building to get upset with 
other tenants in that building. And I, I want people that are going to be able to resolve issues calmly and not get upset. So I really ask them a lot of questions, ask them the difficult, difficult questions. And this is also the point in which any hurdles that I see, I give them the opportunity to overcome. I don't give them the answers, but if they have a, let's say they have a, um, you know, a, um, well, you know, an, an assault, you know, a year ago, they have an assault on their record. Well, I lay it out on the table. I give them the opportunity to explain to me what happened. And if, if anything comes up where, where they say that there's a reason why it happened and they can provide me with proof, I try to get as much paper proof as I can. The more paper proof I can get, the, more, the better I feel. It's all about securing your investment. It's not about being a nice person. And move on to step seven. This is where you make the final decision. You approve or deny. You, you, you analyzed everything. You, you've talked to them. Um, I normally don't make the decision on the spot. I get off the phone. I tell them I'll get back to them the next day. I like to really think about it. Um, I like to pray on it myself. I like to give myself an evening. Um, it's a big decision. You want to make sure it's the right decision. And then I make the decision. I listen to my gut. And once I make the decision, I run with it. I don't second guess myself. I don't question myself. Um, I just make the decision and, you know, go from there. I do my best to make the relationship work. And I look for a long-term relationship with my tenants. Um, and, you know, there's nothing like the saying that practice makes perfect. The more tenants you screen, the better you get at it. Which leads me to my next slide. You got it up, a bear. Mm -hmm. The great news. The great news is that by working with Aurora Real Estate Investment Services and TJ Bencho, which is myself, you have me, yes, me, doing all of this for you. Just like by working with Wealth Building CPA, you have a bear handling all your business structuring, all your entity structuring, all your tax liabilities, uh, setting you up for success. Um, by working with Aurora Real Estate Investment Services, you have me screening each one of your tenants. You, you get the benefit of working with individuals and companies that are specialized in these departments, and you don't have to worry about making a mistake. So a bear and I uh, open our arms and, and, and ourselves to you for you to ask us any questions, but also for you to come on board and, and allow us to be part of your team so that we can help you be successful. Okay, thank you, TJ. This is great information. Um, wanted to give you guys our contact information. We are getting ready to open up the line for questions. If you need to make an appointment, we offer um, free initial consultations, tax and entity structuring consultations. You can give us a call at 1-888-502-3767, or you can visit us on the web at wealthbuildingcpa.com. If you would like to reach TJ, you can call him at 412-498-2790, or you can go to his website at investinpittsburgh.net, investinpittsburgh.net. Thank you, TJ. And right now, um, we are going to go ahead and open it up for questions. So um, I'm going to go ahead and put everybody back um Take everybody up the mute mode. So now the line is open. If you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and ask it. Um, CJ, can you um, see the questions that are on the chat? I can. Okay. So if there are questions on the chat, we can take those. Or if anybody has any live questions, you can ask it at this point. One thing that I did want to say is um, TJ said that practice makes perfect. We all did not start out perfectly. I made my very first mistake um, when I was buying a property, this was in North Carolina, and the broker told me, oh, don't call the tenants because you don't want to disturb them. You don't want them to feel like somebody, something else is going on and then move out of the property. I didn't know that that was a problem tenant. When after we purchased the property and we went to collect the rents, the tenant actually threatened to shoot my realtor. So lessons wow. learned. I will not purchase a property where I do not have the chance to meet the tenant or to engage the tenant and have discussions with them. Never purchase a property with a tenant in it without you being able to interview that tenant because you're going to be inheriting that tenant, so you want to screen them the same way that you screen a new tenant. 
Hmm. All right. So we will go ahead and open it up for questions. Anybody hmm. has any questions for us? That's good. Any questions on entity structuring no or with on existing tenants? Make sure you. Uh... I'm sorry. Was somebody saying something? Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, can I ask you a question? This is Ted. Hi, Ted. Good. Uh, I I thought I heard you say that uh, if uh, if you have a an LLC. Uh, I'm not sure if I heard you right. Uh, does one need uh, a manager uh, for the LLC uh, and the, in a situation where I'm the sole proprietor? Uh, can I also become the sole proprietor and the manager at the same time? Yes. What I was explaining is that there's two types of management structures for an LLC. There's a member-managed LLC, which is what you're talking about. There's also where you have a manager-managed where you hire an outside manager to take care of the LLC. But, yes, you can be the member and the manager at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. And um, usually the question is asked, you know, why would somebody want to have a manager manage? Sometimes you have an LLC where people put money together and purchase their property, or they want to do rehab, and they really don't have time um, to spend the time that you know that is needed to um, take care of the property. In that case, you can designate a manager. You can actually hire a property manager if your you know your strategy is long term buy and hold. You can hire Aurora Real Estate Investments, TJ and his team, as the manager of the LLC. You know, I have a couple of LLCs where I am the manager of the LLC. Um, I'm not a member, but I'm a manager, and in that case, it's manager managed. All right, any other questions? TJ, do we have any questions on the chat? No, just the one that Ted just asked is the only one I see. The same one Ted asked has already okay. been answered. And, and, you know, I I didn't say at the end that, uh, you know, we personally invite each and every one of you um, to come spend a day with us in Pittsburgh to get to know us, for us to get to know you. And, you know, for you guys to get to see what's going on firsthand. Um, I always invite people out for a personal one-on-one -on -one tour. Um, you know, Bear, I really appreciate some of your input and, and, and you know, um, there's different ways, you know, to manage property and, and, you know, I agree with everything you said, that there are certain things, um, that should never be done, uh, when, when managing property. And I only learned that from experience and, um, you know, like you said, Bear, one of those things is, you know, to, not um, let a tenant in, uh, you know, not buy a property without speaking to the current tenants. Um, I, I laughed when you said that because that's so true. And another thing is, is, is do everything you can to speak to the current landlord. Um, if a tenant tries to, you know, really avoid that, that's a big time red flag. I'm sure you would agree, Abir. Um Some current landlords, they will lie um, just to get that tenant out of their hair. Some current landlords won't talk to you because they're scared of, of liability, as I'm sure Bear can attest to, um, just because we're in a Sioux happy country. But at the same time, um, I find that most landlords are willing to speak, and uh, I really, really stress the point of talking to the current landlord. I'd be amazed what the information you could gain um, from that conversation. All right, any other questions? Yes, uh, TJ, if, if, you, if uh, there's no one asking, can I ask another question? Sure. Okay. Uh, I, I believe uh, uh, with any kind of uh, entity, uh, you know, you, you're required to have at least one meeting uh, and, uh, per year. And uh, in that meeting, uh, let's say in a situation, in most uh, real estate investment situations, you know, from uh, at least some of my experience, it looks like most people are sole proprietors running the show by themselves. Uh, if that's the situation, what would the definition of a meeting be? Uh, and then uh, is it also required uh, to have the, uh, the minutes of that meeting uh, any and any amendments to the agreement, uh, have, do they have to be submitted uh, every year? 
I'm glad you uh, brought or, that. I'm glad you brought up that question. Go ahead and finish. And one more thing on that is, uh, are we also required in the situation of a sole proprietor? Uh, are we required to have a third party as a witness to the agreements and to the fact that the meeting was held? Uh, and does that person have to be an attorney or just uh, a witness? Okay, I'm glad that you brought that up. That's a very important question. Now, one of the things that I talked about um, in selecting an entity structure is you want to go with an entity structure where there's um, little ease in compliance, meeting the compliance requirement. You are not required as an LLC to hold annual meetings. Although for business reasons, when I talked about having an integrated approach to wealth building, and we talked yes, about... Yes, usually you want to have an S. S-Corp. Yes, if you have an S-Corp as a C-Corporation that is an S-Corp, not necessarily an LLC that is taxed as an S-Corp, LLCs are not required to have annual meetings. Once you draft your operating agreement, and that's why we talk about the importance of having a comprehensive operating agreement up front. Once you have that, really the only time you need to have a meeting is if you need to revise the operating agreement or make changes to things. So legally, in terms of compliance, you are not required to have a meeting if you are an LLC. If you're a C Corp, yes, you're supposed to have the you know the min, uh, meetings and record your minutes and board of directors meetings and all that, and it has to be recorded. But if you're an LLC, and if in your case you're talking about a single member LLC, you're not required to have a meeting. Although I suggest just as a business practice to always review where your business is headed. Take a strategic look at your business and see what you can do to improve your business. The goal of every business is to make money. And so one of the things we do under the Wealth Building Plan is to do a business analysis meeting. But it is not a requirement. It's just highly recommended in order to grow your business. And in that but, case, you can use your CPA or an attorney, or it's something that mm -hmm. you just record. When you get audited by the IRS, what they mm -hmm. want to see is documentation showing how you've improved your business from one year to the other. And this comes with, you know, people where they're trying to disallow their expenses as hobby losses. One of the questions that they ask is, what are you doing or what have you done to improve your business? It's not like it's required that you, you show your mid and mean it your meeting minutes. Uh, what if you, uh, uh, if you set up an LLC that is taxed as an S corporation? Because a couple of meetings I went to, and I think even from your discussion, uh, especially if you want to go beyond wholesaling to buy and hold and also mm -hmm. flip and rehab, uh, I think it's preferred that you uh, are uh, an LLC taxed as an S. In that case, would you need uh, the meetings? No, because the fundamental structure of the business is, is LLC. an LLC. When you would be required to have a meeting as an S corp is if you're a C corp that I is see. taxed as an S corp. The, on the, the fundamental structure mm -hmm. is a limited liability company, and the only thing that you need